Now it's time for Lefties Losing It. And can you believe the Democrat squad of A-list celebrities wasn't enough to get Kamala over the line? How did the American public resist the call from these learned souls who are so in touch with the average American and whose moral compass is pure and true and who are never prone to crazy delusions? It can't be. It cannot be. If he, is, he wins the election... He, you won't be on the show anymore. He'll come looking for me. He'll, there'll, there'll, be, there'll be things that happen that none of us can imagine. Um, that's what happens in that kind of a dictatorship, which is what he says. Let's believe him. Take him at his word. Even Bill Maher's lefty audience couldn't help but laugh at Robert De Niro there. And I guess uh, Bill Maher's going to lose his show now, isn't he? That's what they were talking about. And in recent days, we even had the ladies of The View not just backing Kamala, but they were picking her attorney general for her. And, of course, they pick the irredeemably awful rhino warhawk, Liz Cheney. Are you also a lawyer? Yeah, I am. So... You could conceivably be a great AG. <laughs> and this was... because, and, and, I, and I say this because your moral core mm. is magnificent. Yeah. Well, but... Oh, isn't that adorable? Whoopi Goldberg lecturing us about morals. I've heard it all now. But Kamala had the unique ability to make even once cool celebrities lose all all credibility. She made the boss, Bruce Springsteen, um, sound like this. Well, I'm just about starving tonight. I'm dying for some action. She turned Cardi B into the world's lamest, saddest joke. One second, guys, one second. Yikes. I can't believe that didn't convince the masses. And Kamala somehow even managed to turn the once hilariously funny Will Ferrell into this cringy mess. I'm just one person? No. Shut the f*** up, Gary. Last time, only a few thousand votes kept Trump out of office. And this time, we will hold you personally responsible, Gary. Don't forget to vote, Gary. And when the celebrity endorsements weren't working, uh, she had her media propagandists uh, use these shameful tactics. We've laid out the stakes in this crucial election where one side stands for freedom while the other meets the textbook definition of fascism, namely a far-right dictatorial regime like Hitler's Germany or Franco's Spain or Mussolini's Italy. Ah, uh, just crazy stuff. That was MSNBC anchor Joy Reid and her colleague and fellow Russian conspiracy hoax peddler Rachel Maddow was even issuing threats to Elon Musk's business empire. The Defense Department and NASA are going to need a new arrangement for all their rockets and for all the multi-billion dollar contracts Elon Musk's companies have with the U.S. government. The U.S. government is going to have to either, I mean, unwind from all of those contracts or Elon Musk's companies are going to have to unwind from him. This is an untenable reality in national security terms. Now that we know what we know about Elon Musk. That sounds a little fascisty to me. Today, Joy Reid was uh, still delusional and claiming that Kamala had run the perfect campaign. And so what you've seen in the last couple of weeks, if this is an audition for managing a complex organization like the United States, Kamala Harris has passed the audition flawlessly. This has been, in many ways, a perfect campaign, a brief, but, and, and she had barely any time to put it together. But eventually, reality sank in and Joy Reid was back to doing what she does best, race baiting and making wild claims, this time about Israel wanting to ethnically cleanse Gaza.
Nobody wants Donald Trump to be more president more than Bibi Netanyahu, um, who is backed by a far right coalition that would like to clear cut Gaza, that would, you know, it would, would truly like to complete a complete ethnic cleansing of Gaza. Meanwhile, Rachel Maddow was lashing out at the American public, chiding them for not realizing just how good the economy is. The United States economy is the envy of the world. Yeah. Yeah. The inflation numbers. The economic growth numbers, the fiscal numbers, the U.S. standing in the world numbers are all off the charts positive. Even the freaking stock market, right? right. All off the charts positive. There you have it. You're just imagining all that economic hardship. The share market is up. It's all good. Rachel said so. Now let's hear from a Kamala fan who saw a man in a MAGA hat and launched into this diatribe. Should be feeling it today. He's going to lose. Oh, Trump. He's going to lose. Good. He's empowering you racist All right? But you ain't a black going to be in the office. And his white is going to be out. We're taking the trash out loser. All right, we in power now. Have a nice day. You have a wonderful day on the 5th, okay? You're going to lose. Okay. And your leader, okay. your cult leader. Bye-bye. You dumb And this next Kamala fan also has learned an important lesson today. Don't get overconfident when you sit in a leftist echo chamber because when reality hits, it's going to hurt. We're going to win. Joining me now is Newsweek Senior Editor-at-Large and Article 3 Project Senior Counsel, Josh Hammer. Josh, you called this election weeks ago. Uh, any surprises in this result? Rita, what an evening here in the United States. My God. Um, look, I, I mean, it's one thing to to project what, what, what your gut is and, and what the early data seem to be indicating. It is, it is another thing to see it play out in real time. I, I'll, I'll be honest, this, this was actually a, a more thoroughly dominant performance than even myself in my wildest dreams could have possibly imagined. I, I, I really did not think that, that there was a high likelihood. I thought it was possible, not a high likelihood that Donald Trump would actually win outright the national popular vote becoming the first Republican presidential candidate to do that since George W. Bush back in 2004. O only the second Republican presidential candidate in my lifetime to do that, going back all the way to George H. W. Bush in 1988. A, a totally dominant performance, outright winning Hispanic men, young black men going to, a, to, to the Republican column uh, for, for the largest percentage, probably in the, in the recorded history of American polling, Gen Z millennials essentially within the margin of error. It's, it's statistical toss-up, the, the the women gender gap not nearly as massive as many pollsters feared that it would be, j j just a totally dominant performance. And we're still waiting to see exactly how long the coattails are when it comes to some of these contested U.S. sentences. We haven't finished putting the pieces of the puzzle together there. But it's looking like Donald Trump is going to have a historically unprecedented opportunity. He's going to have a sizable lead in the U.S. Senate one way or the other. He's going to have control of the U.S. House. He's going to have a Supreme Court majority that's probably going to be a firm over the next few years. We'll, we'll see what, what retirements happen. But conservatives are in suddenly a very good place when, when it comes to America. It seems almost too good to be true. My, my one hope, my one hope is that the not just the Trump administration, but, but, but the broader Republican Party, the broader conservative movement, that, that we not that, that we not vanquish this opportunity. We have to take advantage of it. This is a this is very much kind of a, a, a once every few decades sort of thing. These next four years, every single day is going to matter. We have a lot of major issues. We have to stay laser focused, eyes on the prize. Now that now that this tremendous victory is in the back. And, well, Trump's assembled a remarkable team, so you would think they will be able to, to, to pull it off. You look at the, uh, the talent he has. Uh, we've talked about Elon Musk in the past. He's got Tulsi Gabbard there, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. But also the, the young talent within the Republicans, when you look at the future and future presidential races, J.D. Vance, Ron DeSantis, Vivek Ramaswamy, the future's looking pretty bright for the Republicans. Look, uh, you know, I, I've known J.D. for years. I, I consider the guy a friend. It, it, as I sit here this morning here in Florida talking with you, Rita, 
it, it is completely surreal to me that J.D. Vance is about to be vice president of the United States. I, 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 I feel like I need to like pinch myself. I, I cannot believe that this is like a real thing that is actually happening. I, I mean, he's 40 years old. The dude has literally been the embodiment of the American dream. But, you know, as great as J.D. Vance's mm -hmm. story is, and it, it is an incredible story, the Donald Trump comeback story, my God. You know, I mean, if Hollywood were not as uniformly left-wing as it was, P, you, you know, Paramount, <laughs> Sony, all the major studios would be, would be going to a bidding war right now to get the intellectual property rights to produce this, this, this documentary. W what an incredible story. Rita, they have done everything everything to get this guy going at least as far back as the spying on the campaign back in 2016, the FISA, the Russia yeah. collusion delusion, the impeachments, the indictments, the assassination attempts. Holy moly. I, I, I mean, this is like, uh, th th this is true Hollywood-esque stuff. And, you know, I don't think that we have all fully processed it here as as the sun starts to rise on the East Coast in the United States. But, you know, as, as Ronald Reagan once said, it is morning in America again. You're totally right. This was a unique coalition that brought Donald Trump across the finish line, not just the demographic slices, but people like Dana White, Elon Musk, Tulsi Gabbard, RFK Jr. You know, this is not your grandfather's Republican Party. And, and I say that in a very, very good way. This is not a stodgy old country club sort of party anymore. This is very much a, a movement, the MAGA America First movement, that is a movement of pragmatic, concrete, America First, common sense priorities. It is not lost in kind of the think tank sauce, so to speak. They're, they're concerned first and foremost most about the tangible concerns of the American people. That is a very promising thing. That, above all, I think, is why they have won this election. Now, Michael Schellenberg, a friend of this program, his work with Elon Musk has uh, revealed a great deal about the censorship complex in America. He's called on the Trump to uh, look into America's intelligence agencies. He wants a investigation as part of Trump's administration. He wrote on X that our intelligence community is rotten to the core and serious investigations are required. He talked about the uh, the censorship issue, January 6, uh, the origins of COVID, the lawfare that's been used and really importantly, Josh, the weaponization of, of the CIA, the FBI, the DHS. Do you see this as something that Trump's team will be looking at? Trump's been a victim of this himself. And uh, th again, this might be a once in a uh, lifetime opportunity to actually do something about this issue. Yeah, I do think that the administration is going to be very focused on this come day one. Look, they're, they're having four years to, to get the ball rolling when it comes to day one executive orders, day one sort of things that a that an administration with or without a, a, a compliant Congress can actually get across the finish line there. Ever since the, the twilight days of the first Trump administration, the second half of the year 2020, a lot of people in D.C. have been talking about a somewhat uh, obscure thing called Schedule F, which basically refers to the ability of the president of the United States to invoke executive authority to, to fire people in the executive branch. You know, putting on my legal hat, it, it actually is constitutional law 101 that a president has plenary inherent ability to fire whoever he wants, period, full stop, end of story in his executive branch. After all, he is the one who wields the quote unquote executive power. People are going to call him a fascist for firing, you know, cleaning in-house of the NSA in, in the various other organs of the intelligence community there. But he has that constitutional authority. And I, for one, want those cases to be brought. I want the ACLU to start firing the, the, this sort of litigation after Donald Trump does this. Let's get some good Supreme Court precedent on the books, overturn some garbage precedent from 60, 70 years ago that says he can't do this kind of thing because it is time to clean house. It fundamentally, Rita, above all, is time to actually continue the mission of draining the swamp. And when it comes to, to the topic of draining the swamp in Washington, there are very few things that have to be cleaned house as thoroughly and completely as the intelligence community here. Absolutely. And uh, I think uh, Donald Trump has learned from his first time in office. He's going to have better people around him and... Uh, the bureaucracy isn't going to be able to uh, frustrate his efforts to clean up the swamp. Before you go, the uh, New York Post is reporting that Donald Trump has uh, seen a 50% increase in his support among Jewish voters in New York. Uh, this is compared to the 2020 presidential election. The Jewish community overwhelmingly back the Democrats normally, but the New York Post is saying that Kamala Harris got only 55% 
of the Jewish vote in New York uh, compared to President Biden, who got 69% just four years ago. Is this a reaction to the squad and how weak the Democrats have been in the face of the anti-Semitism we have seen on the streets of New York and on, and on university campuses? Yeah, I think that is a large part of it. You know, it's it, look, Israel matters for sure. The, the overwhelming majority of American Jews correctly view, view U.S.-Israel relations as very important, both for U.S. foreign policy and for the future of, of Jewish life in the world. But, but, but more to the point, it has to do, I think, yes, with the shocking rise of anti-Semitism here on the home front here in the United States, which the Democratic Party, you know, far from, from not condemning sufficiently, has actually fanned the flames of that. You've had people like Kamala Harris say that the mm. protesters have a point, Joe Biden, his horrendous snide remarks to the pro Hamas protesters outside the convention in Chicago. You know, Jewish voters are not stupid. They can hear that and see that with their own ears and their own eyes. And it's about time that Democrats pay some sort of political price. Now, Rita, I still wait patiently for the day that my fellow Jews actually vote majority for, for a Republican candidate. God willing, that will mm. happen sooner rather than later. I think it actually is going to happen sooner rather than later, by the way, given the demographic shifts here within the Jewish community. But this is a tremendous step in the correct direction. It's been a long time coming. And I, for one, I'm just very happy to see it. Anecdotally, I had a lot of family members, close friends in the Jewish community who are not typical conservative Republican voters who actually did cross the aisle this time. So I thought it was going to be something along these lines, but it's, it's great to see it actually happen as well. That's for sure.